Hello everyone, welcome to chapter 6a in marketing analytics. Uh, this uh, chapter, chapter 6, is divided into two parts, 6a and 6b, because it's so long. So this video only concerns uh, the first, ha first half, this is 6a. If you're looking for 6b, uh, you need to go back to the video list. Uh, so this is all about managing your sales force. Making sure the territories are reasonable, that salespeople are adequately motivated, that they can make plenty of money, uh, that they don't get overworked, and hopefully positively impact the bottom line uh, of the firm. So let's kind of jump right into let's kind of just jump right into uh, some examples here, and some calculations. So. We have what we call workload, just basically how long, or how many hours does a particular salesperson work, okay? And so to calculate workload, you need to know how many current accounts they have, just the number of active customers who buy from them. You call them current, you can call them active. Uh, you also need to know uh, how many prospects there are. These are non-customers that you're trying to turn into customers, okay? And you also need to know basically how long does it take uh, to call on a, a customer? How long does it take to call on uh, a prospect? And when we, mean, when we say call on, we just mean that quite simply that how long does it take them to make a particular sales call? So let's go through an example. You work for a medical device company. Uh, at this point in time, you have 37 active customers, customers that are currently buying from you. Uh, we know through history that uh, takes the salesperson about half an hour um, to call on and chat with each active customer. We also know this particular this particular salesperson has a total prospect list or list of leads of 154. And we know that with prospecting, uh, prospecting time is less. It's only 20 minutes because you get a lot of people right off the bat say no, 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 no. So it cuts the average Prospecting, prospecting time down. So plug those numbers in here to our formula above, active customers times customer service time plus prospect, uh, number of prospect customers times prospect time, you end up with 4,190 minutes, which is six, 69.83 hours. This is good, right? Actually, no, it's terrible. So um, if your salesperson is calling on these prospects every single week, they're working 70 hours a week. He's going to burn out 14 hours a day. It's not good. Okay. However, if you allow the salesperson to um, space out the prospects they call on over a certain number of weeks, let's assume they only call on 20 prospects per week, then you end up with a average workload of 28 and a half hours. So it's a lot less. So probably want to get them up, or up somewhere closer to 40 hours. But again, this gives you a good idea of, of basically, um, you know, what, uh, what workloads look like, okay? Sales management is often, a, a, or actually not often, a, sales management is absolutely about managing a, a salesperson's territory. So typically you get into an organization uh, they will give you a geographic region, and um, it's your responsibility to call on potential targets within that particular region. This is very common for B2B, so if you're calling on business clients, this is very common. I've worked uh, in a business where we had uh, specified salesperson territories, and we tried to help uh, manage them and give them tools to to navigate through that territory uh, pretty uh, uh, you know, as efficiently as possible. Here we have uh, an example of a territory. This is an actual territory uh, for a medical, a pharmaceutical rep. Uh, this person's territory is basically all that area in purple. Okay, so any doctor that fits the profile of this particular drug that's being sold, if they're anywhere within that particular uh, purple area, that would be considered uh, that particular salesperson's territory. It's another example, uh, a much larger one. If you look to the south of, of downtown Dallas, 
uh, looks like this. It's that um, peach color uh, territory. Okay, so uh, some salespeople, and again, depends on the industry, depends on the geography, but some salespeople have very large geographic territories. Some people have very tight, very small geographic territories. Typically depends on how many potential customers are in a, a particular area. The, more, the denser the area, generally, the, the smaller geographically uh, the territory is. Here's an example from uh, my career. I actually built this map years ago. Uh, so basically I worked for a company and we had outside salespeople and we put together territory maps for them that basically showed them where all their potential customers were. So this was Atlanta, Georgia, kind of the western side of the metro area and then uh, a lot of the countryside as well. Okay, and so given bunch of data from our, our in-house database, we were able to basically determine where are the uh, salesperson's current customers located. Those would be the green circles. Um, we also were able to map in his home, which is up here in the middle of this circle right here. And then we're able to, every single zip code, we were able to de determine how many potential customers were in each and then color code them. So uh, the redder the, num the, the redder the color, the, the more dense that particular territory was. Um, so it allowed this person to focus his attention in the places where there, where there were the most potential customers. Okay, so, um, and also showed it in relation to where he lived. So was good for him to manage his territory to make sure he wasn't just driving all over the place. Uh, allowed him to save a little money on gas and save time, increase that workload while, while, by decreasing the, um, the average uh, you know, drive time from, uh, from place to place. And so it's an interesting project. We did this for 100 territories and um, was really good to help salespeople, again, manage their territory. Okay. Um, all right. This whole idea of potentials, just again, potentials are just the all in prospects, the, the number of individuals, businesses, or customers, uh, entities that you could possibly turn into customers. So um, here's another example. This was a territory in Central Florida, um, Tampa. Same deal. We had the guys. We had the guys' home address. We had uh, density by zip code. Geographically, this guy was brand new coming on, so he didn't have any current customers yet, so he didn't have, uh, uh, you know, green dots for him. But again, just showed him, and when he first came to the organization, hey, look, if you focus on this area, this area, this area, this area, you're gonna, you're gonna be good. Less uh, distance from your house, more density, so you'll spend more time knocking on doors and less time driving from place to place. Okay, so sales potential. This is kind of, um, we can calculate it uh, in terms of number, you know, number of potential customers uh, as we did in those maps, but you could also do it in terms of uh, dollars, okay? So, good example here is you've got um, a photocopier manufacturer who has identified a number of possible accounts. Okay, and this, this isn't, isn't necessarily the whole territory. Maybe the sales manager comes to you and says, hey, we've identified these as potential targets, so why don't you put these in your calendar for the next couple of weeks? Okay, and um, the list included six small businesses, eight medium businesses, and two large businesses. We, we know from, you know, company history that small businesses – Average purchase is about 500 bucks, medium is about 700 bucks, and large companies is about $1,000. So the question is, given this list, what is the total sales potential? So you just take the number of possible accounts. In this situation, it is 16, and you multiply it by the buying power. So here's how it works out. Because we have 
three different groups of accounts, you have to basically just do multiplication three times and add them all together. So small, six times 500, medium, eight times 700, large, two times 1,000. That gives us a total, loss, total overall sales potential uh, in dollars of 10,600 bucks. Okay, so if you are a salesperson and you see those numbers, you're like, okay, that looks pretty good. I'm going to um, spend some time on that. Okay. Same calculation, different example here. You sell pools for an installation company. Um, you have put prospects into group based on zip codes. You've got zip code A and you've got zip code B. Okay, you know that in zip code A, there are 345 homes that could possibly need a or possibly want a swimming pool. Um, typically in that zip code, customers buy a pool that's twenty thousand uh, dollars. Zip code B, you know, there's 219 potential prospects, and you know that in that zip code, the a the average pool purchase is usually thirty-five thousand dollars. So, question is, what is the total sales potential here? Okay, so it looks just like that. Same calculation as before. The numbers are much, much larger. You end up with a sales potential of $14.5 million. Okay, so if you're hiring a salesperson to work those two zip codes and they see that number, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. I'm going to, uh, that's going to be um, attractive. And so I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a look at this. Okay, so. The question is, well, what does this mean for compensation for the salesperson? We're going to talk about compensation a good bit here uh, in just a bit. But I will tell you in this particular situation, uh, as an example, um, if your commission was 10% on sales and you captured 5% of the entire market, you would end up with a total commission of just short of $73,000. So you take the total sales potential, multiply it by the percent of that sales potential you captured, multiply that times your commission, you get $73,000. Good salary. If they have a, if they have a um, you know, flat salary component on top of that, you know, you would just add to that and the number would be, would be even higher. Okay, so uh, those who want to go into sales, you have to think about this. You know, what is the potential... Uh, you know, amount of money I can make. Obviously, that's important, right? Okay, so salespeople typically are compensated based on performance, um, as they should be. And so uh, we can basically use that knowledge to set some sales goals. So uh, it's important to set goals because it gives, you know, salespeople something to shoot for. It keeps them motivated. So we can, again, create sales goals for salespeople uh, in many different ways. Okay, so one way we can do it is just basically take uh, the salesperson's share of district sales and multiply it by the forecasted sales for the overall district. Okay, so um, to explain this a little bit easier, we'll, we'll do it with an example here. Um, salesperson last year, their, their sales in a particular district, a particular area or whatever was 18% of the entire district sales. Okay, the salesperson sold $1,620 worth of merchandise, um, which represented 18% of the entire district's total sales. Okay. Um, territory potential in the district, we'll know, but we'll talk about this again in just a few minutes. Um, We know that the company has overall has a sales goals, a sales goal, forecasted sales, you could say, of $10,000. Um, so we're not worried about direct sales goal increase right now or territory potential. Just using share of district and overall sales goal, we can calculate sales goal based on prior year sales. So all we're going to do is take the share of prior year sales of district, which is 18%, multiply it by the direct 
Uh, the overall district sales goal of ten thousand dollars that gives us uh, a new sales goal for the seven per, for, for this current uh, salesperson of eighteen hundred dollars so basically what, what we're saying here is okay we expect that overall the company is going to sell this amount of this this volume um, you last year sold eighteen percent of total volume so we're going to carry that 18% forward to the next year, and um, we have a new sales goal, new, you know, forecasted sales for this particular year. So we're just going to take that new overall company-wide sales number, multiply it by your last year's percentage of, you know, total sales, and that is where we arrive at this sales goal of $1,800. The numbers are very low, so maybe you're a uh, you know, college kid, you're selling, you know, cut coat knives or, you know, Mary Kay or something like that. But we could obviously use much bigger numbers as well. Okay. Another way to calculate sales goal is based on territory potential. So uh, companies got, you think back to those maps I showed you earlier, uh, companies got X dollars of total potential. Um, particular salesperson, their territory is made up of X percentage of the total sales potential. And so we can calculate sales goals that way. So um, our territory potential is 12%. Our district sales goal or forecasted sales is $10,000. And so instead of multiplying by 18%, we're going to multiply by 12%. And the, the rationale here is well, if this salesperson's territory is 12% of the total sales potential, then his uh, or her sales should be 12% of uh, total company sales. Okay, so you just multiply territory potential by the forecasted sales or the sales goal, and you get 1,200. Okay, then we have this one. This one is a little bit different. Okay, um, this basically we're going to basically add something to last year's sales total. So the, the previous two ignored the previous year's sales dollars. It looked at percentages, but not dollars. But this, we're going to actually use the actual dollar amount. So these are all the numbers that we've already seen. But basically, we're going to take um, the territory's share of sales potential, which was 12%. We're going to multiply that by the forecasted sales increase for the district, which in this case is the $1,000. And to that, we're going to add the salesperson's prior year sales, uh, which is that number right there. Okay. So it looks just like that. 1620 plus 12% 12 times 1,000. Okay. So basically in this situation, it's like, okay, um, you know, we're going to carry last year's sales dollars forward and multiply that or, or add to that the territory potential okay so 1740. then we have something called weighted share of sales allotment so in this situation basically um, we can kind of add a couple other figures to this to make it probably a little more representative of uh, potential and performance Okay, so we're going to throw our same numbers in here. Uh, the sales manager has decided that I'm going to uh, weight salespersons' goals 50% on their share of sales and 50% on share of potential or territory potential. Okay, uh, so all we do then is we take the 0.18 times 0.5, you add to that 0.12 times 0.5, okay? And that gives you a weighted share of sales allotment of 0.15. And then all you do then is you just multiply that by the forecasted sales, which we do here. And that gives you sales goal based on weighted share of sales allotment of $1,500. So they've, they've um, figured in both the salesperson's share of sales and the territory's share of potential to, to arrive at a different sales goal. Okay, so 
a lot of different sales goals there. Uh, you know, any homework or exam questions, well, it'll be very clear what, what we're looking for in terms of that. So make sure that you kind of understand the difference between share of sales and uh, you know, territory potential. So uh, again, territory potential is the total number of potential sales or what in, in dollar figures within the district. Uh, what percentage of that total is one particular territory and then share of sales is just basically what percentage of company sales were this one particular salesperson okay all right so we set up territories we set sales goals and we can kind of think about uh, how we evaluate sales performance a lot of different ways but there's a lot of sales force effectiveness ratios we can use and they, they're here, they're very straightforward, they're very quick ratios, okay? Um, so, salesperson, for example, makes uh, 1,200 calls, sales calls, and they result in $438,493 in sales. That gives us a sale sales ver divided by contacts with clients or sales divided by potential count of $365.41. The difference between this ratio and this ratio are very subtle. You can assume, you know, again, depends on how you define it, but contacts with clients and potential accounts, you could kind of see those potentially as the same thing. There will be no question that makes you decipher uh, between those two, uh, you know, to distinguish between those two. Okay, sales divided by active accounts. We already talked a little bit about active accounts already. Okay, uh, salesperson has opened 392 new accounts, resulting in $954,342 in sales. That gives a sales effectiveness ratio of $2,434.55. So that's the average number of sales per active account, you know, from a dollar standpoint. Okay, sales divided by buying power. Um, salesperson makes $394,321 in sales in his territory. Um, the total territory buying potential is $12,493,543. That gives a sales divided by buying power effectiveness ratio of 3.16%. Okay. Um, so the question is, why is this number different from this number? Uh, well, buying power takes into account the, you know, uh, total money that can could be earned or, or revenues that could be generated from a particular territory. Okay, so you know, richer territories are going to have a. a uh, uh, a sales to buying power number uh, it's going to be different than if, if it's not a kind of a, a wealthier territory. Expenses divided by sales here. Um, a lot of salespeople incur expenses that the company has to reimburse. So you sometimes not only assess sales performance, but also the uh, ability to you know keep costs down. So Got a salesperson that makes six hundred forty-nine thousand five hundred ninety-five dollars uh, in sales for the year. He gets paid ten percent commission on his sales. He gets five thousand dollars for a car reimbursement and two thousand dollars for his health insurance. Uh, the question is, what is his effectiveness ratio? So the total number of expenses are going to are going to be. Um, his salary plus the other expenses, okay? So you take sales divided by his commission of 10%, and to that you add, you add the car allowance and the health insurance, okay? And that gives you um, this number, and I realize I have neglected to put the, the, the denominator. What you would do is you would put all this in parentheses, divided by 649,595, and that will give you a expense to sales ratio 11.08%. Okay, so sorry I didn't put that in the, the denominator. It's probably not clear because of that. All right, compensation. Then we got to talk about how we pay 
uh, salespeople. So I've mentioned a couple times about commission and salary and those types of things, but um, companies have to set up a salary system that is uh, not only clear, but also motivating to the to the salesperson, and um, but also allows the company to be profitable and, and extract value from using salespeople. Okay, so the basic one is just a flat salary, or you could do a flat salary plus a couple bonuses, and that's what we have here: is compensation equals salary plus bonus one plus bonus two. Okay, if you got a salesperson. Uh, they earn a flat salary of $50,000. This does not vary uh, depending on how much merchandise they sell. Um, if he gets to a certain level, he gets a bonus of $5,000. If he gets to another level, he gets another bonus of $3,000. And so that gives us a total compensation for the salesperson of fifty-eight grand. Okay? So that's salary plus bonus. Then we have salary plus commission. Okay, so commission is just the percentage percentage earned on you know total dollars sold. So uh, a lot of companies they do pay their salespeople this way. It's a flat salary plus a percentage commission on all sales generated. Okay, so we've got someone who makes two uh, percent commission on sales up to a million dollars. Uh, and then above a million dollars, they earn a 3% commission on sales, okay? This person also gets a flat rate salary per year of $20,000, okay? So, here we are, salary is 20 grand, commission one is 2% up to a million, uh, commission two is 3% on sales over a million dollars, there's another typo there. Um, so, what is the total compensation? Flat fee plus the commission is actually, you know, in two components. So the first component is um, uh, sales up to a million, and uh, second commission is sales over the million. So if this person sold $1.2 million in sales, this is what the compensation would look like. So 2% of the first million, 3% of the last 200,000, add those together, add it to the flat rate of 20,000, and you get a total compensation of $46,000. So could be good, could be bad, just depending on, on the context and the industry and, and uh, the workload and all those types of things. So again, when you see commissions like this, remember that the higher, you know, the, the second commission here, is based on sales just above the previous commission level. So it's not 2% times a million plus 3% times a million. It's 2% on a million plus 3% times whatever is over a million. So on sales of 1.2 million, that would only be, you know, you'd only be earning 3% on that 200,000, not the full 1.2 million. Okay. All right. When thinking about sales, sale, the sales force and personal selling, you oft, also have to think about how personal selling impacts the organization from an operational standpoint. Okay, so, and this is especially true when you're talking about uh, an organization or an industry where you know the sales result in something that has to be manufactured or something that has to be. Uh, you know, built from scratch, or maybe you know, a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, things that have to be shipped that other people in the organization are responsible in carrying out. So you have to kind of uh, because of that, you have to operations likes to get sort of a, a, an accounting of what do we expect workload going forward. That way they can anticipate how many employees they need, scheduling hours, those types of things. Okay, so. We have this thing called the Salesforce funnel. Just um, you know, the impact of the Salesforce on work for uh, you know the organization as a whole. So there's this figure from the book that kind of shows you what we're talking about. Cold leads are just you know companies you haven't called on. Warm leads are those where there might be some interest. 
prospects are now legitimately potentially considering to buy your product. Uh, then you may have meetings with the prospects to try to get them to, to close a deal. Uh, and then finally, after the purchase is made, there is the kind of the, the delivery or the fulfillment of the product. So we can calculate kind of this whole idea of the Salesforce funnel and kind of the outcome uh, of the Salesforce funnel is just basically the number of upcoming transactions or upcoming sales. So let's look at an example. Let's come straight from the book. Okay, so you've got um, uh, Sandy and Bob. Uh, they want to figure out the number of transactions that will be done in the next five months because again you know maybe you're building a software package for these customers and so the software developers need to know uh, kind of what's coming up that way they can schedule time to make sure they, that they meet all the demands okay um, over time sandy and bob know that uh, cold calls are not super successful. 2% of cold calls become sales within five months. 14% of warm calls become sales within four months. 25% of prospects are converted to sales within three months. 30% of customers who agree to a meeting are converted within two months. And 53% who agree to a purchase meeting are converted to sales within one month. Okay, so historical information uh, just put in here, you know, for. Uh, example sake, uh, as an organization, you would have to define what do you mean by cold call, what do you mean by warm call, what do you mean by prospect, okay? Uh, but quite simply, we can put this table together based on uh, what we know about these two salespeople. So Sandy has 56, 56 cold calls, 30, 30 warm calls, 19 prospects, five who have agreed to a pre-purchase meeting, eight who have agreed to a purchase meeting, and, and so on and so on. So uh, basically what we can do is we can develop uh, a sales funnel and just estimate or predict or project upcoming sales. So it looks like this, okay? So we're going to add up Sandy and Bob's total number of cold leads or cold calls. We're going to multiply that times... 2%, okay? Because we know that 2% of cold calls become sales within five months, okay? We know that 14% of warm calls are converted to sales. So we're going to take the warm calls or warm, le warm leads for Sandy and Bob is 30 plus 51. Multiply that by the 14%, okay? Prospects, um, Sandy and Bob collectively have 19 and 13, 33. To add those together, multiply that by 25% because 25% of prospects are converted to sales within three months. Okay, we know that 36% who agree to pre purchase meeting will purchase within two months. So Sandy has five, Bob has 16. Add those together, multiply it by that 0.36, and that's the number you get. And then finally, we know that purchase meetings have a conversion rate of 53%. So we'll add up the two purchase meetings, eight and four, multiply that by 0.53, get all that, add all those together, you get a, a five month sales uh, funnel or sales pipeline, you know, projected number of sales transactions of 41. Okay, um, so again, it's a good number for sales managers to see, for production and operations managers to see, they can, again, kind of uh, figure out what's going on and schedule things going forward, okay? So that's the sales pipeline. All right, that's all I've got. Questions? Please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, and we'll see you next time for Chapter 6, Part B.